Hi there, welcome to today's Protocol Labs Research Seminar. Today we are joined by Dr. Yevgeny Dodis, who is a fellow of the International Association for Cryptologic Research, or IACR, and a professor at New York University. Dr. Dodis has over 150 scientific publications at top venues and is the recipient of various awards, including the IACR Test of Time Award, which he's won twice for his work on fuzzy extractors and verifiable random functions. And today, he will be talking about random number generation and extraction. So Yevgeny, I will let you take it from here. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, um, anyway, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll do my best. my best. This is a long talk, and in fact, if we can choose uh, uh, which directions to go, we'll uh, definitely finish on time. But if any topic is of particular interest, please uh, um, ask me to uh, go more in depth. Okay, so uh, for the uh, way of introduction, some introductory slides with pictures before we dive in into technical stuff. Um, it's not a secret that randomness is needed um, everywhere. There are um, a lot of use cases uh, here, approximation algorithms, distributed computing, and so on and so on. Um, of course, for this uh, talk, I'm going to focus uh, last but not least on cryptography. So what are the applications of uh, you know, why is randomness needed in cryptography? Um, and again, the list is uh, uh, relatively obvious, but we'll go through it just for the sake of clarity. Most importantly, secret keys need to be random, otherwise they're not secret. So that's how we formalize secrecy from the attacker. Uh, for privacy, things like encryption, secret sharing, zero knowledge, multi-party computation, we need randomness to randomize things so that even if you repeat the same message, people don't see that it's the same message. Um, you know, many kind of low-level usages for replay attacks, uh, preventing replay attacks, uh, adding like random, you know, unpredictable various applications of unpredictability, like short fingerprints and so on, uh, anonymity. Um, differential privacy, that's a, a common way to uh, achieve this field called differential privacy is to add uh, some kind of random noise uh, to the otherwise correct answer. There are some efficiency applications like you know, best primality testing algorithms are probabilistic. Uh, and even I know less about it, but learning even like blockchains and cryptocurrencies, obviously, they need like things like Byzantine agreement, uh, PCPs, SNARKs, uh, you name it. So it's an important thing. So uh, the other thing, of course, my last uh, joke, and then uh, we'll dive into hopefully serious, pick, uh, serious uh, topics, uh, but randomness can lead to attacks. Um, I'm listing very incomplete set of attacks. Somewhat surprisingly, I was even involved in some attacks uh, involved with bad randomness. Um, but the summary of all these attacks is uh, it's not easy to attack RNG, but when the attacks are possible, the failures are really spectacular. You're like it covers the entire secret key. You can snoop on the conversation. You can <laughs> listen everywhere. So it's not like, you know, sometimes people find some weaknesses that they can distinguish some bit, I don't know, whatever. Uh, like a tiny little advantage, which is above the theoretical bound. Here we're talking about complete breaks of the system. So we definitely want to, to get it right. So um, the question is, why do we get randomness for crypto in this case? Right? So, and the answer is we used to the random number generators. So this is a common design principle. So uh, well, again, maybe it's a little bit of a joke. Uh, so from the perspective of the user, uh, so the random number generator is like a button. So for those of you who are uh, from the United States, we have the store called Staples here, and it's famous for this red button, which says this is easy, and you kind of press the button and <laughs> everything just com comes up to you. So, so here will be the student random number generator, you press a button, you get a random number. You press it again, you get another random number and so on. And of course, it's kind of nice for the consumers who go to Staples <laughs> to buy the random number generators, but uh, you know, we engineers, we need to design them, where does it come from? And what happens is this so the random number generator needs an input, and that's why we call it PRNG with input. And the input is what we call entropy sources. It's something that we heuristically believe has some uncertainty to the attacker. It has some entropy, like mouse movements, uh, keyboard timing, maybe temperature, but the most common one is really here. This is timing of interrupts. There are millions of interrupts happens in the computer. All of them come with this um, date stamp, um, um, uh, you know, and uh, it's like 32-bit <laughs> number, sometimes 64 even, 
Um, so it's believed that it has a lot of uncertainty to the attacker. Even if the attacker looks at the interrupt, like this nano, micro, whatever, like uh, seconds, it's completely infeasible to predict them correctly, uh, exactly all those clock cycles. Um, so this is the most common source of interrupts. We'll see why it's relevant later. Um, and, oh, sorry, what it, uh, something is, okay. And the problem with this, even though they have entropy, they're not uniform, not independent, not fresh, and sometimes even adversarial. Maybe the attacker can, uh, I don't know, uh, pretend to type on a keyboard or, I don't know, <laughs> run an intensive thing to hit the processor, whatever we want, or even like cause some interrupts. And to compare it with um, the state of art of other things, um, which is like other cryptographic primitives. So if you look at things like advanced encryption standards, SHA-3, authenticated encryption, digital signature schemes, all of them started kind of ad hoc and crazy, but they matured over time. Almost all of them have some kind of uh, um, standards by now. And you can argue that some things we can do better, but I would say uh, basically by now, people just use any of the hash functions. They're not going to design their own hash functions. They will use SHA-2 or SHA-3 or something like that. In contrast, if you look at the PRNG thing, there is a standard I listed here, but it's a, in a pretty primitive state. If you look the way this standard is written compared to this other standards, there is a lot of crazy ad hoc stuff. It's under specified, sometimes contradictory. The way papers found this conflicts in it. Um, it has some scandals uh, uh, for those who know there was like this uh, uh, um, ECDBRG mode of operation, which was later believed to have a backdoor, maybe even intentionally planted by NSA because NSA recommended it. So, um, just not mature, basically. So the hope of uh, kind of my research over the last 20 years, and maybe not, I'm being a little bit dramatic, but I kind of try to put the state of the random number generators at least on par to me uh, to make it um, you know somewhat comparable with the small mature fields of cryptography. And in fact, I will dare to go even further, as we will see. PRNG, it's basically a non inter I mean, even though there is interaction, but from the perspective of user, it's a very simple thing. There is no input, there is just an output. If you think about encryption, hash functions, there is an interaction with the attacker, like getting ciphertext signatures. If you think about it, at least uh, from the perspective of the user, it's like a button. I didn't have to tell you like a security game or something. I just told you what the user expects. So in some optimistic universe, we can hope that we can understand it much better uh, than some of those other things. And we can, it can be like the most powerful of all. It will be like the foundations of maybe all cryptography. But maybe I'm dreaming, but at least uh, this is a hope. OK, so um, now that we talked a little bit about the lack of proper standardization and fundamental understanding, um, well, what do people do in the real world? Like there are all those operating systems, all of them need randomness sample. We still use encryption and so on. So, so what happens is um, they do a lot of, uh, uh, well, sometimes at hoax, sometimes not. I'm going to talk about it. But the important thing to remember is that the good ones, the ones that we believe work, they use what we call cryptographic hash functions. I will come to it in uh, uh, more details. I just, I, I usually have backup slides about it, but I decided to just basically summarize it. Uh, uh, the state of the, oh, actually, I do have a few slides, sorry, so let's skip some of them. But yeah, kind of going very briefly over it. Um, so Linux, the random, it's like, it's complex. It has uh, over 800 lines, of course, very ad hoc and heuristics. One of my early papers in CCS 2013, when we tried to look at it from a theoretical perspective, it was complete garbage. I mean, it was just, bra uh, yes, attacks are not exploitable, they're theoretical attacks, but it doesn't accumulate entropy. It's very easy to reverse engineer, see if the attacker has control on interrupts. Uh, so from a cryptographic point of view, it's real, it's garbage. But uh, of course, in practice, it works. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you fast forward nine years, it's not, uh, um, you know, just uh, me saying it for the sake of writing another paper, uh, people, you know, in Linux, you know, the field is maturing. They start to realize it. So, in fact, this is the email that I got uh, this January 15. I met Jason Donville, I think, in Real World Crypto uh, right before the pandemic in 2019. We started this conversation. I complained to him. He was in charge of like Linux RNG, or at least ho hoping to be in charge. So this is the email that he, uh, he sent me. He said, "Hey, after like meeting a." Uh, 
So as you finally wrestle the control of Linux RNG, I can you know finally start working. He wrote a very long email. It was like three pages. I was like, oh my god, I hope I have time to read it. It's exciting. With like very detailed thoughts, but he ended it with uh, I mean you can read it. It says my goal with this RNG project is to have every component as rigorously proved as possible. So I think it's a fundamental. It's like a fantastic jump from complete security by obscurity thing to trying to fix it. And in fact, this expert, both from the emails and also there is like GitHub page about his thoughts about it. Um, and I was a little bit humble. <laughs> uh, basically, all the papers he referenced here when he was like looking for ideas to discuss things from me were my papers as, a, as recent, you know, as like last year. He explicitly said that uh, this paper, this kind of work, this doesn't work. Uh, and some of them will be used. Um, you know, the final decision is not made, but th they will be used basically in the next iteration of Linux RNG. So for me, I have to admit, I, I love applied crypto. I love when my stuff gets used, but by training, I'm a theoretical cryptographer. And I found it completely fascinating that uh, this work that I just did for the love of it, uh, uh, it was kind of fun, um, really, really have, has impact on uh, such a major product. So we'll see how it goes, but uh, yeah, definitely they're going to use at least some of our work, uh, you know, some of the work that I'm going to present here. So that was fun. Windows and Apple actually surprisingly were doing better from the beginning. Apple has a thing called Yaro. Windows has something called Fortuna. Um, and yeah, part of my work from the ones that I'm eventually going to spend maybe half of this talk is going to be about uh, proving that to some extent the entropy accumulation seems to work in the way they design it, or at least in our abstraction of how they design it. Uh, they also have this thing which probably, unfortunately, I didn't have time to talk. But something cool that there was a lot of discussion about something called premature output calls. We call it premature next problem. Most likely, we don't have time to talk about it. There was heated discussion on this um, uh, Linux, uh, um, I think also CFRG mailing list. I was you know, involved in it where whether this protection again is a single premature next is needed. It was kind of decided probably it's not needed for Linux, but Windows and Apple anyway protect from it. So as a result, because it is used in Windows and Apple, and you can debate whether such paranoid notion of security is important, we did analyze it in crypto 2014. We analyzed some kind of uh, idealized version of Fortuna, and then uh, a more you know a more closer to reality version of Fortuna, which is not as secure. Unfortunately, um, you know my student is going to present it next week at I Information Theory Conference in Boston. So uh, also last year at Crypto and ITC conference, we also analyzed something else called super fast entropy accumulation, which is used in this random number generators. And it will also be used to some extent in the new Linux RNG. Uh, so it was kind of really fun um, that, yeah, uh, that a lot of uh, work, some of it were recent analyzes uh, practical RNGs. Uh, so, and I, and I would dare to say, even though those guys were predating some of my work, it's, I definitely got feedback. I'm talking to both Windows and Apple designers. They took some of our proofs and some of the optimizations to tweak some of their parameters back. I mean, some of it I might mention if we have time. So I, I believe it had like a feedback uh, loop backwards. Yeah, I started from analyzing those things, but then um, they actually took some of our, um, you know, minor optimizations, suggestions, and uh, changed, changed their design a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to switch to... Um, PNG theory, and as I said, you've seen a lot of papers, so there's no way I can go. I mean, I'll just give you some kind of highlights, and hopefully we get uh, you know uh, some understanding. Uh, we'll be happy to answer more questions offline and so on. Okay, so let's try to for formalize this PNG with input, except uh, in yeah, in, in the final papers they formalize this, but I want to start with an easier problem where instead of producing many times, you repeatedly press the button, you just want to press the button once. And this is called a randomness extractor. So yeah, so what is this randomness extraction? So our goal here is to take those crazy entropy sources and to convert it to a single bit string. And the hope is that this, this, this bit string is pseudo random. So no distinguisher can tell this string that we output from a truly random string. So let's give it a name. The input is going to be X. The function is going to be X. The output is Y. And our goal is to distinguish Y from U. U will stand for uniform distribution, right? Um, of course, the big question is what assumptions about X you make. I mean, of course, that uh, makes a whole difference. So the best assumption, so this notation means it sends something from an entropy, but the details are not important for this talk. It's some notion of you know, entropy, mathematical way to, to count how much entropy is there in the distribution. 
So it's not truly uniform, but it has this gamma bits of entropy. And our goal would be to say that as long as you know the input has entropy, the output is uh, should be random. Unfortunately, in this level of generality, um, this is impossible. So even if you want to extract one bit, it's kind of trivial <laughs> to come up with artificial and realistic kind of distribution, but the distribution would be uniform pre-image of zero, for example. I mean, one of the pre-images of zero and one will have a lot of strings. So let's say zero has more strings than one. So I just, I can even efficiently sample. I can pick random X until extractor X output zero, right? So, but this seems really contrived, but it does satisfy, you know, it has very high entropy. So basically uh, it just shows that we, you know, we need to do something to overcome this, uh, um, uh, this stupid, um, you know, counter example. So I had a detour, so I'm not going to go to this detour. So uh, let me move to the kind of more practical part, um, which is, okay, so we have an impossibility of a general thing. How do we work around it? So how do we have impossibility results and workarounds? So there are four of them. I will probably have time to barely cover the first two, but it's it's okay. It's kind of to get you the introduction and hopefully whet your appetite to read more or to ask me to present again or something, but yeah. Um, so all these workarounds, they're not fully disjoint, but the amazing thing about them, I, 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 that's why I kind of love this area. This PNG, it looks like a simple button, but because for various practical considerations, all of them play the role. All of them were helpful in some aspect of RNG design, whether it's super fast entropy accumulation or premature next or just extraction module itself. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Yeah, feel free to interrupt these questions, but yeah, this is kind of a high level overview. So let's start with the seeded thing. I'll be a little bit uh, kind of brief just to give you the highlight because that was important, but turned out to be less important than the other ones. So uh, the idea here is to generalize the notion of extractor from the one that takes only, you know, deterministic function that takes an input and output the randomness. It also takes this random seed S, which sounds a little bit strange. We'll talk about it in a second, but for now, just bear with me. The security says that even condition on the seed, the output of the extractor is pseudo-random, up to some statistical error, let's say. And the canonical application, if you think about it, is like maybe key derivation. So you have this X, which is like secret randomness, and S is public randomness. Maybe it's published in advance, or you know, kind of some trusted source, or think of like initialization vector, or something like that, uh, for sure. And the hope is that if X is kind of independent of this random seed S, you can get secret randomness, from public randomness. So R is secret randomness, S is public randomness, so it's not completely chicken and egg problem. We are gaining something. We are gaining secrecy. So, and the key property, of course, of the quality of the extraction, aside from the actual efficiency of the extraction function, is the entropy loss. So the maximum we can extract is the entropy of X, but we're going to extract a little bit less. And the difference is called entropy loss. And ideally, we would like the entropy loss to be very close to zero. Unfortunately, Radhakrishna and Tashma showed that any epsilon secure extractor, at least in this level of generality, should have entropy loss to log one of epsilon. If you want to extract from all high entropy sources, right? That's our goal. And there is something, again, super famous lemma called the Tovar hash lemma, which says that something called universal hash function, and if you don't know what it is, like think about matrix vector multiplication, something very simple, um, achieves this entropy loss. So it looks like we are basically done, or at least in theory, it looks like we are done. Um, but the cons of this approach is that the seed is somewhat large and the entropy loss, despite being optimal, is also large. So what do I mean by that? How bad is this two of one of epsilon entropy loss? So many practical sources, they don't have this extra, you know, two times security parameter basically to waste. So like if you think about biometrics, I want to get like a key from my fingerprint or retina scan, like physical sources, even sometimes in low entropy environments. More important, even like if you think about um, Diffie-Hellman on elliptic curves, you get basically a random group elements. You still need to hash it to get a string. And yeah, I understand you want to get maybe computational security, but even for computational security, you still need to have some information theoretic security to begin with. Um, so for this thing, if I want, to use some kind of leftover hash-based approach, basically translates to a larger, um, well, or if, if my entropy lo 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 loss is low, it gives me a smaller group size and it gives me higher efficiency. 
So this is not about entropy deficient environment, it's just about the size of Diffie-Hellman group. So basically minimizing the entropy loss gives us much more efficient protocol because we can get the entire group element converted to a bit string as opposed to waste a bunch of bits of it. Like for example, in practice, if I want uh, a yes-based application, this is traditional level of security that we kind of want for them. The entropy loss would be 256 bits, which is, you know, a little bit large for some cases. Uh, and the other thing, I don't have time, I had some backup slides for it, but if you have some kind of heuristic extractors uh, using like random oracle model, uh, we'll talk a little bit about something related, but not this, it's very trivial to see that they basically for free convert unpredictability to the randomness, kind of one-to-one one -one exchange. Uh, so in practice, of course, people say, hey, we are okay with some kind of random oracle model or something, <laughs> we'll, we'll rather use a smaller elliptic curve group. So people are just not going to use this stuff. Uh, so one of the questions that I asked in this series, so where, well, me and my co-authors and students, can we probably improve this entropy loss for key derivation functions? And uh, anyway, this is a joke, I should probably skip it. That's my claim to fame. That's the closest I got to a reference in the New Yorker magazine. So the paper was called after Orka Schlemmer revisited, and there was a reference in one of those First, this is actually one of the first popular press articles on about cryptocurrency in October 10, 2011. Uh, a reporter from New Yorker came to crypto, like took a bunch of interviews. Uh, in the process, for whatever weird reason, my paper got mentioned. I think because this paper was starting the conference and basically he said, he said something like, oh, I saw these cryptographers as serious people, but I look at these weird titles and understand it's a bunch of jokers or something like that. But you know, listen, you don't uh, choose your New Yorker reference. I'm happy I got reference. So anyway, uh, famous paper by now. All right, so um, what, what is the point? Okay, so what's the point of this work? Um, the question was, do we really need the statistically random R? Yes, if I get extracted bit statistically random, I'm in good shape, but maybe it's kind of an overkill. And um, for some applications, no. I mean, for some applications, not an overkill. If you really want a one-time pad encryption, yeah, there is not much you can do. It's not very hard to see. But what was surprising in a series of uh, papers from like crypto, TCC, and to more crypto papers, um, for most of cryptographic applications, somewhat surprisingly, we managed to beat this Radha Krishna and Tashma bound in a provably secure way. And the key side that there is a difference between extraction and key derivation. So if you know that you were deriving a cryptographic key for the application, you can use the quirks of that cryptographic application um, to do better. That was like really surprising to us. So unfortunately, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, in Malta, basically when I gave my uh, summer school in Malta, I uh, took another presentation and spoke an hour and a half about it. Here I'm just going to condense into, into one table just to give you a survey because this is like the least relevant to um, real world RNGs. But kind of I like this work, so I want to tell you what we did. This was just known before our work that for any computationally secure application, you can use SHA, you get entropy loss zero, kind of for free, uh, the assumption is like random oracle heuristic, uh, and what is the minimal entropy that is kind of enough to derive an AES key, for example, 128 bits, one-to-one -one conversion, right? Uh, on the other hand, if you want to do it using leftover hash lemma, because of this entropy loss, there is no assumption, but you need 256 bits of entropy. So, you know, how can we close the gap between 128 and 256? So first, it's like in this paper that reference in New York, we developed, we, you know, formalized something called square-friendly applications. It includes a lot of things. It includes all signatures, for example, but it also includes semantically secure encryption, not like one time pad, which is not semantically secure. You can only use it once. But like, if you use like, I don't know, any like CPA secure encryption, for example, you can use exactly the same leftover hash lemma that was, the paper was called Oktober Hash Lemma Revisited, and you can have the entropy loss from two log one of epsilon log. So in concrete things, the size of the elliptic curve could be smaller, for example, right? So um, you need like only 192 bits of entropy. So if you want, you can say, you know what, I, I still want this 192, but I want to do it for everything. I want to even do it for some like pseudorandom functions, which are not covered here. So there are some applications which are not covered, like pseudorandom functions or pseudorandom generators. If you want to go there, like a small tweak to the construction, which, yeah, I mean, the kind of details don't really matter, but something very practical, a very small tweak to this construction basically gives you the same thing from one way functions. So you kind of, you need to use an additional computational assumption, any pseudorandom generator and uh, 
basically get the same result. Um, that was like we noticed it in a TCC paper next year. And finally, in a Eurocrypt paper the following year, we did something really surprising. Following predictability applications like digital signatures or mass authentication codes, we basically the entropy loss is like tiny. Yeah, it's not zero, it's like log, log one of epsilon. And this is like a concrete number. So, you know, there is like plus four or something. So we get like very, very close to this. So anyway, so this was like a summary of this work. Uh, so I'm ready to move on if there are any questions, but yeah, I'm cramped literally like four papers at Crypto Eurocrypt into <laughs> this one slide, but I, you know, uh, hope it kind of uh, makes sense to some extent. But, you know, the reason I kind of wanted to go through it quickly, you can say, oh, wow, this is fantastic. Let's just apply it to PRNGs. And just to recall, the reminder is PRNG takes some kind of, maybe we'll have a seeded PRNG. We have some seed, we have some internal state, we have some update based on like timing of interrupts, we get random bits, something like that. Um, and the answer is, you know, both yes and no. <laughs> I'll give you uh, uh, two contradictory answers. On the other hand, in our original work, we did use seeded extractors. And in fact, this paper that I mentioned, that's also papers that attack Linux and formally for the first time define this problem of entropy accumulation, which turned out to be very important for subsequent work. Um, we did use seeded extractors kind of as a first approximation, but really kind of people didn't use like our suggestions. When I came back to Linux and also Apple and they said, hey, we have this amazing paper, you can use universal hash. And I, I don't know, it's like, I don't know about that. And there were two problems, two reasons why they didn't do it. Um, one reason is not real reason, it's like a more theoretical reason, like, oh, chicken and egg, I need randomness to extract randomness, but I, I think it's okay. I mean, you can probably trust like Apple to, uh, maybe not, but some who, <laughs> unless I want to completely screw you, I had a paper about backdoors to the random generators, but kind of you can maybe trust, uh, like use digits of pi or something like that, I don't know. So maybe this is okay because you see this is public, but the bigger problem is that in all this analysis, the source must be independent of the seed. And you know, if you publish it in all like operating systems or whatever, I mean, this is just too much. This is unrealistic. Somebody will find out it's public. Um, so in the long run, it's not a sustainable thing. And the attacks are really catastrophic. So if you know the seed, because everything is like information theoretic, some AX plus B, some simple linear algebra, Basically, the attacks are like completely catastrophic. Well, in contrast, if you use cryptographic hash functions, yeah, there might be some theoretical attacks, but they don't seem to be catastrophic. So in practice, nobody would ever use this. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the point that I was making. So basically, this brings us to the second point. All right, let's see what people use in practice. And I told you, in practice, people use this cryptographic hash functions. Um, the nice thing about those things is that they're seedless. We think they work in practice. And, but the analysis is done in an idealized model because you know that's what cryptographic hash functions it means. Um, so um, so let's go into this kind of thing. So um, let's start with this folklore result, which everybody kind of knows um, and kind of um, and understand um, about using random oracle as an extractor itself, right? This is like the result I told you about zero entropy loss and stuff. Um, the model is very simple. So you have this source of mean entropy um, gamma, and you will use G of X as your extracted randomness. And the point is, if the attacker makes Q queries, bounded number of queries to the random oracle, the chance that the attacker is going to query it exactly on X is Q times by union bound, Q times two to the minus gamma. So modulo this event, G of X is random because that's the only way the attacker can get information about G of X is by querying the random oracle here. So you're kind of done. It looks like we are done. Unfortunately, this is not, this was like bothered me for years until finally we wrote this paper, which uh, I, I, I mean, I shouldn't say it on my, my work, but it took many years. I'm really happy about this work at Eurocrypt 2019. Um, yeah, but basically those are the two things that bothered us before we fix this problem is from a theoretical standpoint, it's very unsatisfactory. Random Oracle is like an exponential seed, right? Because we are assuming effectively implicitly that X is independent, right? It's called Oracle independent source. And we assume that X is independent from random Oracle. So we effectively using exponential seed by in theory, we can even use like a, you know, very like, like logarithmic seed. So it's just very unsatisfactory theoretically, but also in the practical things, it's also unrealistic. For example, if you think about PRNG that uses timing of interrupts, this PRNG runs on the system. It itself causes interrupts. So clearly, because you know, uh, 
the interrupts it causes would not be independent of the random oracles because they're called, you know, they're caused by evaluation of G. So kind of there is this chicken and egg problem. So this assumption doesn't seem to be completely realistic for these practical sources. So I wasn't like really happy. And because the result is like too trivial, some points like, yes, I believe random oracle is a good extractor, but it just doesn't look like the right assumption about the sources. So it was kind of bothering me for a while until we found the solution. So, and the solution was to define the problem in a more careful way and to formalize what we call Oracle dependent sources. To say, listen, how, you know, I want to say that the source itself, it doesn't come just, you know, kind of on the bottom in a way independent of G, but it could be influenced by the random Oracle. So abstractly, we have the attacker, he makes a bunch of queries to the random Oracle, output X, and then the attacker gets a challenge. G of X is things, and the constraint is that in, uh, mean entropy of X is gamma. Of course, this doesn't really make sense, the way it's written, <laughs> the attacker knows X, obviously he can just query G of X directly, right? So attacker has to forget something. I mean, it has to be, if the attacker is really outputting the source, it's unfair that the attacker should remember it. So we kind of model, we think the attacker is like really split into two parts, like nature and the attacker, so he has to forget something. So we can say, you know what, he outputs X, but then he has to forget something, squeeze everything he knows into state uh, sigma, and then has entropy based on this. Again, a moment reflection shows it doesn't work. For example, I can output, I, can, I don't, you know, I can, uh, you know, call G of zero and call it X and just output X and don't keep any state. Because random oracle is random, G of zero is random, right? So uh, it, it just will satisfy this thing, but obviously not to the random string, it like totally, everybody knows it will be G of zero. So um, I, I normally I would have more slides until we arrive to the right conclusion. Let me tell you the right answer. So the right answer would be to condition not only on the state on the attacker, but also on the queries that the attacker makes here. So this way I'm saying, listen, the attacker has to forget something and the entropy really has to come up internally from the attacker and not from the random oracle. That even if condition on queries, there is some extra randomness. So I'll comment a little bit why we believe this is a good modeling in practice also, but let's see what it buys us. Uh, oh yeah, so you know the intuition is exactly this thing that entropy has to come externally from inherent randomness of the sampler, and not because a sampler sample depends on the random oracle interaction. We're really trying to model like timing of interrupts, like uncertainty in measuring interrupts, so like some thermal dynamics or some heat waves or whatever, like users moving the mouse, not because oh it's like my mouse movement is depending on SHA2 or something, right? So so yes, we can depend on random oracle interaction, but you need to give me more entropy. So I feel like it's a very reasonable way to model it, but now things become interesting, all right? And the good news, and to me, it's a positive, it means that we did the right thing. We can prove the theorem that under this modeling, we get exactly the same bound as before, all right? Q times two to the minus gamma. It's the same as in random oracle independent bound, but now we include many, many more sources. In particular, we believe, we solve this chicken and egg problem, we, you know, we can include sources that we care about, like timing of interrupts that could depend on the random oracle. And the proof actually yeah, is like a few lines longer, but now it's kind of basically this condition exactly matches with the intuition. That even condition of this is gamma, every query is a distinguisher kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, if this, none of these queries is actually likely to query it on X because effectively we are kind of, in this elegant modeling, we are prohibiting this high probability for the sampler to, I mean, this is a sampler and the distinguisher together for any of the queries to be on the input X. Yeah, you can output X, but you're basically not allowed to query directly. Um, and this is like an elegant way to model it. So anyway, this is like a cute um, a little kind of warm up. Um, we also have an information theoretic version. So I, I felt like this is like the right way to do it to, uh, you know, have a common generalization of standard extractors. So in the formation theoretic version, you can have Q queries while you sample X, but you know, you have to satisfy this condition. After that, you get a challenge, but now you can make infinitely many queries. So after that, it's kind of too late. You can query the entire random oracle, but because you've already forgotten stuff, good luck, it's not going to help you intuitively. We call it everlasting privacy, so attacker makes bounded number of queries while sampling, which kind of means that the nature probably doesn't depend on too many, you know, evaluations of the random oracle, like imperfections of measurement and so on. But yes, attacker, even if like years later you want to break it, you're fine. I mean, it's not going to help you. 
And we get actually a similar bound as before, but there is an extra term, and an extra term for those of you who know comes from this leftover hash lemma technique, which is uh, so in some sense, even for this practical thing, we use tools from the serial extractor literature. Remember, I told you we are going to use some tools from serial extractor literature. So like the leftover hash lemma is kind of useful in this more practical bound. So the question now is, okay, great, we did this cute little result. It's like three line, okay, instead of three line proofs, now you have like five line proof. <laughs> um, are we done with extraction? Why did they write a European paper? Is it just for the definition? Uh, oh, actually it was a crypto paper, but uh, never mind. Uh, the problem is in the real world, we don't have this monolithic random oracles. So what we needed to build, we needed to build online extractors. And that's how real extractors, you know, actually works in operating systems, such as Apple and Windows. So more precisely, the problem of online extraction is that the source doesn't come at once. It comes into these blocks, like interop one, interop two, interop three, and all of these interrupts have tiny amount of entropy individually, but together they have a lot of entropy, right? But the extractor cannot like remember all of them. The online extractor has to have a small state and it has to iteratively process them one at a time. And finally, when the user is ready, you press the button, and you have this finalized function. So you have this refresh function that updates the state to accumulate entropy. And then you have a finalized function to, <clears throat> uh, you have the finalized uh, function um, to, um, to, actually get, um, to, to actually get the output. So, um, oh yeah, this, this is kind of in the, in the pseudocode. Um, and, oh, sorry, I'll put it in a second, but the nice thing about it, only the syntax is fine-grained. The security is the same. We still want to run an SOI, but the syntax is a little bit more, you know, constrained that basically you have to iteratively, uh, you know, compute this refresh procedure, finally call finalized. And of course, in our things, everything will be in some idealized model, like random oracle or ideal cipher or something like that. So technically, all the algorithms have oracle access to this ideal primitive, which is fine including the attacker. So here is an example. Um, so here is an example like CBC Mac. It's a very popular online extractor. So um, you have like start with a fixed state and then you just source the input, apply a random permutation or some kind of fixed key block cipher, and then you keep doing. It. So this is a refresh function. It just takes state, source the input, applies permutation and keeps doing it. And, uh, the, and this is a final output, right? So this is, um, and in fact, I had a crypto paper Oh, almost two decades ago, but yeah, like 18 years ago, uh, we proved it in the random permutation model in the Oracle independent setting. This is a good extractor. We even had some very good bounds and so on. So introduce some new technique. Um, in fact, it's one of the suggestions in the standard. Remember I told you this immature standard? One of the suggestions there. If not enough, it was also used by Intel RNG. So this is a physical, they have this on chip true random number generator. They still need a post-processing function. They use CBC Mac and they cite my paper here, why it's secure. But now that we have a new model and we can ask, wait a second, is this secure in the Oracle dependent setting? And someone surprisingly when asked the question, the answer was no. I mean, normally, I mean, I can ask you a question. It's a very cute attack. Would you guys be interested to see the attack or should I move on to the summary? Now, let me know if, you, if you're voting to see the attack. It's cute. It's not, it's like two slides. Or should I move forward uh, with a summary? <laughs> Any preference? I'm monitoring the chat. It could be a vote of one zero. I see, uh, yes, all right. So let's see the attack. I think it's actually, I like even though it takes time from the summary, I would like to see the attack because I think it's it kind of shows you that what we did and kind of explains it. So let's see the attack, all right? So let's try to remember what we're attacking. So we're attacking CBC. So the attacker can call a random permutation and then outputs a bunch of blocks x1, xl, in our case, you can compute all of them in advance, you will see. And, uh, you know, the attacker has internal randomness, and it has to make sure that this internal randomness uh, has entropy, even condition on its state and this thing, and, you know, whatever, so it's clear. So here is what the attacker is going to do. Block number one, flip a random bit, and says, okay, it's, this probability one half will be zero to then, this probability one half will be one to then. And then the attacker forgets. He says, you know what, I myself will forget all these random bits, the attacker samples them, gives them to the challenger, but then forgets them immediately. He says, yeah, you know, that's where the entropy will come in. So this coin the attacker forgets, but what is the output here? Well, if you look about the state from the perspective of the attacker, it forgot this coin, it's either pi of zero or pi of one. 
All right, so what is the next block? And this is a cool idea. Well, I shouldn't say about it about my own work, but <laughs> sorry about it. But uh, so this is the idea where you can see why the fact that the source can depend on the random permutation helps. The second block will be either zero to the n or pi of zero plus XOR pi of one. So if you think about it, you kind of flip it. If this is pi of zero, it will be either pi of zero plus zero, so it's pi of zero, or it will be pi of zero XOR pi, you know, or it will be pi of one because pi of zero cancels. Similarly, here it's either pi of one or it will be pi of zero. But distribution wise, it's the same. Nothing changed. <laughs> See, distribution wise, you added this kind of random, you know, you added one more bit of uncertainty, but this distribution is still with probability of one half, it's pi of zero, with probability of half pi of one. So this is a critical point. I want to make sure you guys get it. Right, and you see that I needed to evaluate random permutation to create this, you know, this input. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to know what pi of zero plus pi of one is. So you apply here. So it means that the state here is either pi square of zero, like pi of pi of zero, <clears throat> or pi square of one. You can guess what the you know attacker is going to do here. It's going to be with probability one half this guy with probability one half this pi square of zero plus pi square of one. Again, because of this cancellation, <laughs> distribution wise, nothing changed. And you can keep going. At the end of the day, you inject it like L bits of randomness, but the state only has one bit of entropy. So to finalize the attack, I don't care what finalize does. It could be the fanciest, SHA-3, whatever, you, I don't care. It has it's a deterministic function. So what the attacker will remember is just pi L of zero of pi L of one, those two things. Um, and with this, it's completely clear that the attacker can distinguish uh, the output from random, right? Because, you know, the output anyway has only at most one bit of entropy, but yeah, the attacker can just check, oh, is it finalized of pi of zero, finalized of pi of one? So clearly it's not going to be secure. Um, but basically the point is after L steps, I claim I did accumulate L bits of entropy because the attacker, I mean, it honestly forgot those bits, right? And this distribution is like basically independent of these bits. So, so basically, I I, the attacker injected L bits, but only one bit of output was produced. And this is even conditional on everything. So I hope it kind of gives you some idea why our notion is not completely trivial. A very popular construction actually is not secure in our setting. So you have to be kind of careful about it. So yeah, so anyway, we spend time, but uh, I like this counter example, hopefully it explains in a concrete terms what our notion does. So now you can say, wait, wait a second, we had this, insecure online extractors do you actually have secure constructions <laughs> well fortunately um, yeah some people ask me what is this hippo doing here uh, i don't know i just wanted to do to uh, <laughs> to explain what online means that you keep doing the same thing again anyway uh, the hippo came uh, to, to life uh, with this um there is a good question um i'll, I'll address I'll, I'll address well i don't know if you already left but uh, i mean i'll address it maybe in two minutes just so that we can find a good spot. Um, great question. So let's look at some other practical construction, perhaps even more popular than CBC Mac, but kind of similar popularity is a Merkel Damgaard construction. You just have a compression function and you just iterate it and you just output the final state. And we argued, so it was secure in the Oracle independent setting, but here, fortunately, we proved it secure with a much more complicated proof, but it is secure in our setting. So we are good. In fact, even information theoretic version could be secure, but here you need to truncate. It's not hard to see if you don't truncate, it's not secure information theoretically. Um, I mean, not very hard to see because in some sense, yeah, I mean, if this has no, I mean, yeah, it's not hard to see, I will not tell you the reason why, but if you truncate a little bit by like two security parameter bits, um, you know, which is reasonable for some of the longer hash functions, which are like 512 bits, uh, or something like that, or even 256 is reasonable. Uh, it will be secure in the information theoretic sense. Um, we also, everybody, of course, asked us, like, who got Kravchik immediately said, what about HMAC? What about HMAC? Because everybody is using HMAC. So we had a section on the paper, it was more painful to analyze because it has some weird things. It's like iPad, OPAD, but good news, it's secure. Okay. So, uh, you know, for people who use HMAC, HMAC was designed for a different reason, but luckily, it wasn't screwed up enough. I mean, you, you could just use Merkel Denver. You don't need to do this bizarre stuff. But fortunately, the bizarre stuff doesn't help you. Um, also, if you want to go a little bit inside SHA-2, 
So compression function of SHA-2 is, uh, it has this Davis-Myers construction from the ideal cipher. We don't know the details, doesn't really matter just uh, for the summary, but basically um, also secure the ideal cipher model. So we're in good shape. And finally for SHA-3, uh, sponge construction. So sponge construction, you can think of generalization of CBC max. So if C is equal to zero, this is CBC max, which is insecure. But fortunately, sponge does kind of have this absorbing part, and I forgot whatever the other name is. It does have this non-trivial separation on R and C, and as long as there is something which the attacker cannot control, the C is non-trivial, like it's more than like security parameter, they are good. I mean, so here technically, sorry, one important caveat, you cannot output the entire state, you will have to output like this part, because otherwise it's like reversible, right? So if you output the whole thing, you can go back, but if you output this thing, it's, it's fine, right? So, um, so these are kind of our results. So uh, the seedless variant was proven in a uh, cool paper in Eurocrypt 16, but we proved the seedless variant. Um, so I'm going to go to this slide and then I will uh, answer uh, Yolan's question. So what about applications? Well, you know, uh, for one thing, it will be used in the upcoming Linux RNG, but it also already used, uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, that's, I, I was making a different point. Um, I told you about online extractors, which is like one time problem, but what if you want to do it multiple times? And here you see I put like zero to them to emphasize seedless. Um, uh, fortunately, everything works. Um, you know, uh, everything will give us a seedless uh, PRNG. I mean, first, just for completeness, um, yeah, I mean, maybe I should go a little bit faster, but uh, um, anyway, I'll just, uh, uh, you know, the difference between a PRNG and online extractor is that you extract many outputs, right? So you don't extract only one, you can press a button many times. And as a result, uh, the finalized function need to be generalized to what we call a next function. Rather than just outputting Y, it also has to say, hey, I'm not done yet, I still have a state to go. Uh, but with this abstraction, everything uh, kind of, you know, you can define an adversarial model, it becomes more complex, attacker, you know, I will not go into it. But basically, a natural generalization of online extractor will be this full notion of PRNG with input. It is more complex, but uh, you know, in, in particular, it must handle state compromise. If you compromise state at some point and then you inject entropy, you should recover. This is a, a challenging thing to do, but we can do it. So um, Python is with some tweaks. I'm giving you as an example, for example. For the sponge tweak, previously we just out output SR and like, go home. But now I have to tell you what the next state is. And it turns out that Hutchinson, in a different context, it wasn't a seedless context, but he kind of came up with a right function. You know, we're still going to output this Y, but I'm going to, in order to produce the next state, I cannot just take those two guys because Y is kind of known to the attacker. I'm, I'm basically going to apply random permutation to both of them. This unfortunately also doesn't work because it's reversible. But if I add this fast forward XOR, kind of play with Davis Myers, everything works out. So basically the point is extraction result with some tweaks gave us a full PRNG results. So, um, okay, so I, well, I started a little bit late, but maybe I will take like five more minutes, maybe six minutes if it's okay with you guys. So if you want, I, um, so, so if it's okay, but yeah, please stop if, you, if you'd rather <coughs> you know, wrap up now and take time for questions. Oh yeah, uh, I, I do want to address your last question. Maybe I'll just give you a little bit of advertisement for the other two parts of the talk. I actually believe it's opposite. So Ilan asked the question, are these forgetful adversaries realistic? I believe absolutely, because in fact, not only they're realistic, I believe that we are being super paranoid. I believe that I am modeling something which is much, much more powerful than real world nature, which is I think is a good design in cryptography too to model something stronger than what you need. And basically why? What I'm really trying to capture is randomness in the timing of interrupts. So what I'm saying is, I said, listen, I'm not extracting like, oh, because the interrupt depends on some call to SHA. I'm not extracting from the input outputs to SHA. What I'm extracting is there is some imprecisions, like there is some clock jitter and you don't exactly know what, you know, this nanosecond or even like terasecond, whatever this is. This is what I'm extracting, for, right? And the, from the perspective of the attacker, I model the attacker as both nature and the real attacker, the guy who's like trying to mess up with the interrupt and actually the nature that produces interrupt. 
So the real attacker doesn't control nature that much and it's okay, I can try to predict the interrupt, but probably forget something. So basically my attacker is not just an attacker and there is like nature that the attacker doesn't control. I'm basically allowing the attacker to control nature and then forget. This is much, much more powerful. But I think it's a good principle in cryptography. Do something which is more elegant, has a shorter definition and captures a larger class of attackers than what you want. So I, I, I feel, <laughs> yeah, uh, so there is, so if anything, I think the complaint uh, that, you, you know, my interpretation is the complaint could be the opposite, I'm losing entropy. Basically, I'm saying, yeah, you only count the entropy from the interrupts in reality. Maybe there is some hardness and SHA that you're not capturing. And I'm saying, it's okay. I mean, hopefully there is enough ent entropy in nature to get a clean result. So it's true. Maybe I'm losing a little bit of entropy, but I'm okay with it. So, so this is my interpretation, but great question. So yeah, we're kind of running out of time. I'll tell you a little bit, just maybe like in two, three minutes, uh, a preview of this. Uh, uh uh thing which i really like is it has some cute pictures so i've done this a png and it turns out there is a problem which is no we are not done even though it's like a good piece of it practical prngs interrupts happen so frequently there is no way you can evaluate sha for every interrupt it's just not going to happen right so here is a heuristic solution that people use in the real world <coughs> friend three interrupts they do some kind of what is they split refresh function into two parts they don't call it like that, I call it like that, but there is a fast refresh function that is called on every interrupt. And this is super fast, no way I can call SHA-1, just not enough time. And then, you know, slowly, kind of when time is right, you kind of accumulate a lot of those calls, you take, so this is X, you have this register R, and then you kind of periodically will call slow refresh, which will be a cryptographic hash function, and then you get the state S, and this is what the user interrupt, interacts with. So the user who needs randomness, will kind of inter interact with this, this output of the slow refresh. But in reality, basically, we need to split our refresh into two parts. And this part cannot be a cryptographic hash function. So this is a cool kind of part. So just to tell you a little bit <coughs> of what is done in practice, I probably will not be able to cover our crypto paper last year and so on. But just to give you an idea of what people do in practice, in practice, uh, uh, fast entropy, so the slow one is just sharp. And the fast entropy accumulation practice is rotating sort. So this is what people do. I mean, the intuition is you have a bunch of this kind of registers, you do something super fast, and I hope if, if black tells you the amount of entropy, you hope in some heuristic ways that you can actually accumulate a lot of entropy together without calling a cryptographic hash function. So this is kind of the Windows 10 RNG. It's very, very simple. Uh, it's actually, it uses rotation. So you take the current register R, you rotate it, cyclically rotate it, and then you XOR the next timing of interrupt. So alpha rotation number, R is a state register, and X is a timing of interrupt. And in particular, Windows 10 rotates by five. It has 32-bit register, it takes it, rotates it by five, and then XORs the next timing of interrupt. And intuitively, why rotate? Because all the entropy of timing of interrupts usually in the low order of bits. So you want it kind of to propagate to more and more bits. This is kind of uh, the philosophy uh, of uh, what these guys do. Um, uh, so let me just see. Yeah, so uh, so this is kind of the intuition. You have some entropy here, you have the guy here, you rotate it by five, it moves here, X has entropy here, you XOR it, you have more entropy. So this is a kind of informal intuition, but the question is kind of how to formalize it. Why rotation by five? Well, why rotation to begin with? <laughs> why five and not six? Yeah, six would be horrible, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, um, uh, you know um, so yeah, so uh, basically uh, what we did, um, you know, and, and the other challenge, this is the last thing I say, and I, I will kind of uh, uh, wrap up. Sorry, guys. Yeah, I know I'm uh, kind of going over time, so I'll wrap up uh, after this slide. Um, uh, basically, it's clear that we cannot have the same strong models that we had for slow refresh. We cannot make the attacker too powerful because this rotating source is just even simpler than linear algebra. It's such a simple function. So cryptographically, you're going to reverse engineer and break it. So we had to work hard to kind of cut some corners and make something reasonable uh, so that we can prove something. And um, anyway, I will not tell you exactly how we did it. We kind of, uh, uh, you know, we wrote like a bunch of, you know, we had like these two papers, uh, uh, one at crypto, one at ITC, uh, formalizing and trying to understand the soundness of this super fast entropy accumulation. Uh, there were super cute pictures, so you can read the paper. It's just, uh, it was very applied work at the end. Uh, and the fun thing about it, I want to say, this is like one thing that I want to say, 
it was, I mean, it was like super practical problem. But at then we used techniques from Fourier analysis. So I like one of my favorite papers, like starters, like, I don't know, Windows 10 RNG, something super applied, uh, formalize a problem, use techniques from free analysis, some cute math convolutions and so on. And then went back to practice and drew this like super funny pictures, uh, kind of arguing that, yeah, Microsoft choice is uh, good, but Apple's choice is even better. <laughs> you know, Apple use rotation by seven. So it was kind of fun to do those uh, practical things. Uh, we designed even some better entropy accumulation function instead of rotation, we use something else. Anyway, I'll um, I'll wrap up. Uh, we are not even close to done. There was another problem which I didn't talk about, but I'm going to move to the uh, to the summary slide. Sorry about it. It was kind of surprisingly fun area with a lot of questions, diverse connections. Um, there are real world implications. Um, it combines theory and practice in both directions. Um, uh, the point is the seedless PNG extractors are important and. Hopefully it's time to move this problem to the 21st century. So um, anyway, this is, uh, uh, sorry again for going over time. No, this is great. Thank you so much.